Today we're in Matthew 26. We're going to be looking at the simple subject that's really very deep, the subject of betrayal, the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ by one of his comrades, one of his companions, whom we know by the name of Judas. And so we'll be looking at betrayed today, found in Matthew 26, verses 47 through 56. So let's begin reading together at verse 47. I'll read to verse 56, give you some highlights and some background, reminding you of some of the things that are taking place up to this point, and then moving into the passage and looking at it as a Bible study to see what is it that's going on and looking for application, how does that affect us today? And so beginning at verse 47 and reading to verse 56, Matthew chapter 26, and while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12, with a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So Jesus is ministering in the garden of Gethsemane. The name Gethsemane literally is oil press, and that's where he's at, the place of pressure. And we've seen how that the Lord had been in fervent prayer, and we'd seen the effect of that that night. And as he's been there, he's been speaking to his, his disciples, and he's been teaching them that they need to remain spiritually alert. You see, he'd been attempting to prepare them for what was about to take place. Earlier, Matthew tells us in chapter 26, verse 2, that after two days, Jesus said, after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So Jesus has been preparing them for the events that are about to transpire. As he had been teaching them in verse 31 of chapter 26, he had said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So he's preparing them for what is about to take place, even telling them that they will forsake him and that they will flee. Now, obviously, as we've been going through the passage, we know that the apostle Peter did not believe that was possible for him, though he, he would have felt that it would be possible for the others. For himself, it wasn't possible. But Jesus is saying, no, indeed, it is possible. All of you indeed will forsake me. You will flee. So in spite of all this preparation, the disciples failed to grasp what he was saying. As he's in this garden, and we saw this last time, he had withdrawn to agonize in prayer. And as he had done so, they had fallen asleep. In verse 40, it says that he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. In verse 43, he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Now Luke is called the beloved physician. He was a doctor. And Luke gives us a doctor's observation of what contributed to their falling asleep. In Luke 22, verse 45, it says, when he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. And so they were so exhausted from the sorrow and the sorrow of heart that they just took the natural route and, and they fell asleep. But Jesus was busy praying. See, after this, Jesus went away a third time and he prayed the same prayer that he had just prayed. He prayed, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Well, in the midst of all of that, his disciples were still not listening to him. They weren't heeding his words. 
They were still yielding to their flesh. They were spiritually unprepared. They were dealing with their sorrow in a natural way. They were simply sleeping. And that's why in verse 45, he came to his disciples and asked the question, are you still sleeping and resting? They were so subject to their natural appetites, they didn't even consider him. And then in verse 46, he said, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Well, Mark tells us in chapter 14, verse 41, he came the third time, said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? But he went on to say, it is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. It is enough. Those words can simply speak of them taking in enough rest and it's time to get up and to go. You're going to need energy to deal with the rest of the events of this night. You see, his disciples had failed to be aware of him, but he remained aware of them. He's their shepherd. He simply watched over them as they took their rest. So on his own part, he was strengthened. He was at peace and he was prepared. Verse 45 tells us, though, that the hour came upon them and they were unprepared. Jesus went out to meet his enemies instead of allowing them to approach him. That's what verse 46 is saying when it says, Rise, let us be going. See who betrays me, he who betrays me is at hand. They're about to find out who this betrayer is. They still don't know that it's Judas, Judas who's the one who's betraying them. Remember that night when Judas had left the supper? They thought that Judas was simply going on an errand. In John 13, 29, some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So they're going to find out now who the betrayer is. Jesus had said, one of you will betray me. They at the table had begun to speak amongst themselves, discuss amongst themselves as to who Jesus might be speaking concerning. They all had said to him, is it me? And now they're going to find out who this betrayer is. It's Judas. It says in verse 47, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. So here comes Judas. And Judas is making his appearance. As he did so, that must have shocked the other apostles. It's interesting that he's still referred to as one of the twelve. He's referred to in that way because it amplifies his treachery. One of Jesus' trusted apostles is betraying him, but he didn't come alone. John tells us in chapter 18 of his gospel, verse 3, that Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Mark 14, verse 43 says, Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And so he came with a multitude, which included a detachment. When it speaks concerning a detachment, that's what is called a Roman cohort. That's 600 men. The officers speak of the temple police armed with swords and clubs. Again, Jesus had said, let us go. So he went out to meet them. And as he was still speaking, Judas now enters into the garden. Now, Remember, there were eight of the apostles that were stationed in the garden. So he was allowed to get past those eight who were stationed at the entrance. And he approaches Jesus now to complete his mission. It's dark. And so it would be easy for Jesus to simply melt in with the others. So how is Judas going to identify Jesus amongst the other men? Well, notice verse 48. His betrayer had given them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. Mark 14, verse 44 adds the words, take him, lead him away safely. When I first read that, lead him away safely, I thought, well, perhaps, perhaps Judas was showing some compassion for the master, but that's not what that means. And it says, lead him away safely. He's really speaking in terms of the safety of those who are arresting Christ. And he's saying to them, lead him away in order that he might not escape from you. And so as this is all taking place, and that's their sign, whomever I kiss, verse 49, immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. We're going to look at that for a moment. Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Psalm 55, verse 21 says this, his speech is smooth as butter, 
yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. As we look at this, I want to develop this with you. I want to give you three things in this simple greeting, where it says, greetings, Rabbi, and that he kissed him. One, the word greetings can be translated rejoice. It's an expression of joy. It was intended to express the joy of Judas at finding Jesus and being with him. Second, a kiss is a salutation that demonstrates love between friends. And Judas kissed him tenderly again and again, so it would be clear that it was Jesus. Now, when we read concerning that Judas came and kissed Christ, we have to put it in its cultural perspective. At that time, a man would kiss another man on the cheek, and it was a, it intended to demonstrate a friendship, a, a relationship, a love. It was something that was personal, and, and it was something that was beautiful. You know, we, we Americans um, today uh, maybe see that as a, a little bit odd even to this day. I mean, when I first got saved, you know, and I was being taught about being affectionate and having love and demonstrating love, that was a new idea for me that, that I could actually hold another man's hand in prayer you know, or, or hug another man, that wasn't something you did. You know, not, not in my day. You, you don't hold another man's hand when you're praying with them. You got to be kidding me. You know, you look at them, but you don't hold their hand. I can still remember when I began to learn to pray, and we used to have a bunch of people who would, would form a circle, and we, they would, they'd say, okay, we're going to pray, and I would do what I had been taught. I'd put my hands in front of me, and they said, no, 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 we don't do that. We hold hands. I <laughs> say, you got to be kidding. You, you got to be kidding. No, no, we, we hold hands. So I hope there's a girl next to me. I wouldn't, but there were guys. And I can still remember grabbing their hands and squeezing it real tight. Like, don't get any weird ideas, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I was real uncomfortable with it. And I had a friend named George. And George was very affectionate. And George would walk up to me and he would, he would hug me. Hi, brother. And he'd, he'd, he'd hug me. And I wasn't used to that. We, we didn't do that. It, that wasn't part of the way... I was raised, my, my dad was not a physically affectionate man, like most of your dads probably, if you're a man, your, your dad probably wasn't very affectionate either. Mine wasn't. My dad would hit me in the back of the head or punch me in the arm, and that was love, you know, but I, I so when I actually had a, a, a man my age putting his arms around me and, and holding me, I, mm, you know, I, I, I was really... So I started learning at an early age what affectionate really, affection in Christ really is. You know, the scripture says, greet one another with a, a, a kiss, you know, and I thought that's great. But when you find out that it's the men would actually give kisses to the other men, I had to learn an awful lot about what that meant. And very insecure for a long time about that. Even when this church began, I was still learning to be affectionate and all. And one day I was out in the front after, after church service. It's been over 30 years now. And uh, there was a guy who was there I'd never met. It was his first time there. And um, he wanted to talk to me. I was standing outside. He walks up. I still remember it like it was yesterday. He walks up to me, and he had this real, real kind of like testosterone was just coming out of every pore of this guy. He was very macho, very macho guy. And he's kind of standing all straight like this, and he's talking to me. And he, and he wants to talk to me. It's his first time in church, and he wants to talk about what it means to be a Christian, and I'm sharing with him about that. And, but I'm picking up his vibe, and this is, this is Mr. Macho, you know, and, and I'm picking up his vibe, and, and uh, as we're speaking, here comes one of my friends who's very affectionate to me, very affectionate to me, and he comes walking by, and I see him, and he, he, he waves at me, and I, say, and I wave back, how you doing, man, you know, and he goes, and he walks past me and comes back and walks up, in front of Mr. Macho, and when he walks up, he says to me, I haven't kissed you in a long time, and he kisses me. <laughs> he still does. And I thought, well, you know, welcome to the family, man. You know, so... This, this affection is actually a very biblical thing. The men would actually give greetings of love and affection to one another. 
And that's what it's all about. So when he comes in and he says to him, greetings, that's another way of saying, I rejoice, I've been looking for you, and now I have found you, and I'm with you, greetings. And then he kisses him as a salutation, demonstrating a love that was between friends. And what's interesting also on top of this, when it says that he kissed him, the word kissed means repeatedly and tenderly. So it wasn't just walking up and giving him uh, just a little peck on the cheek, if you will. It was the kind of thing where he took him and started smothering his face with kisses, not out of affection, but to make sure that those who were going to arrest Jesus knew that this is the one whom I spoke of, the one I kiss, and I'm making sure that you know that this is the one that you're to take. He said to him, Rabbi, the word rabbi is another way of speaking of him as being his dear teacher. He said, you are our teacher, and you have given us joy and love, and I am showing this joy and love to you. But in reality, I'm using your own teaching to betray you. Betrayed with a kiss. You know the word worship. The word worship is from the old English worthy ship. We break it into worship, worthy ship. And it, it speaks concerning the worthiness of God when you worship him. And Bible commentators that I have read over the years have pointed out that worship can also be described as kissing the face of God. Worship is kissing the face of God. Judas is acting out worship by kissing the face of God, but he's doing it with hypocrisy because he's betraying him. Rabbi, you have taught us to love one another. You have taught us to, to care for each other in every way, shape, and form. I've heard all of your teachings. You are very dear to me. And I'm simply expressing to you in practical action the things that you've taught me when in fact my act of worship is in reality an act of hypocrisy and betrayal. As I was thinking about this even this morning, I was praying, God, help me not to worship you like that, not to kiss your face with hypocrisy in my heart. Not to say, I love you, Lord, when in fact I've got other plans and I'm doing other things. Not to say, I will follow you and, and I'll do the things that you've taught me to do when in reality I ignore the things that I know are true. Let my heart not be like Judas. And when this is taking place, I want you to see how Jesus responds to him. Notice verse, verse 50. Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Friend, when you look up the word friend, because the New Testament was written in the Greek language, and so what you do if you want to get a meaning, understand the root of this, is you look up the Greek. And the Greek word, when he says friend, is translated close companion. It speaks of somebody that you worked side by side with. It's a word that today... Uh, not so much today as in past years, the word comrade, when we use the phrase like he's a comrade in arms or this is my comrade, it's a way that speaks of a closeness in a work relationship and a life experience. We're comrades. And so Jesus speaks, speaks to him and says, you're a friend, you're a, a close companion. I have worked side by side with you. You are my, my comrade, my close, affectionate friend. And in essence, it could be like Jesus is saying, Judas, remember all that you have gone through with me as you're doing this. Remember. Remember that you were numbered amongst the 12, selected from the multitude. Remember, as we go through the, the Gospel of Matthew, we've seen that multitudes would follow Christ. And out of the multitudes, Jesus had the 70. And then out of the 70, Jesus had the 12. And so he would be saying to him, out of all of these people who followed after me, Judas, remember, first and foremost, 
that all of those people that would have liked to have had time with me, who would, would have liked to have spent time with me, heard my words, and, well, you were one of those 12. I selected you from the multitude. And, and Judas, remember, you were given my message to proclaim to those who are lost. And Judas, remember, you were given power to cast out demons and to heal those who are sick. You need to remember, you were given the knowledge of things that were hidden from others. In, in Matthew 13, when Jesus gives a series of parables, um, the disciples approached him and, and, uh, and began to question him concerning his teachings. And he said, you're the ones that have been given the privilege of knowing these things, and these are things that are hidden from others. But to you, they have been revealed. You, you got to think for a minute what an incredible privilege it was where some things were hidden from the multitudes that these men were given teachings about. They knew things that others desired to know. Judas, you were one of them. Judas, you were selected from the multitudes. Judas, you were given the message of salvation. You proclaimed that message to the lost. Judas, you received power from heaven. You cast out demons. You healed the sick. Judas, you were given knowledge of things that were hidden from other people. And, and Judas, you were there in Caesarea Philippi. The time that I asked the question, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Judas, you were there when I said, but who do you say that I am? And, and Simon Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You heard that. And you heard me when I said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar Barjona. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. You saw that. You've been around from the beginning all these years. You've heard so many things. You've done so many things. You have been witness of so many things. You were there. You saw me raise the widow of Nain's son from the dead. You saw me raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. And recently, you saw me when I stood at the tomb of Lazarus, and I said, Lazarus, come forth, and he came forth. You saw it. You were there. You saw Peter when he walked on water, Twice you saw the miraculous feeding of thousands, and, and you were there when I cast a legion of demons from the men of the Gadarenes. You saw these things. You saw me perform my first miracle. You saw me cleanse the temple twice. You saw me when I showed that mercy to that woman caught in the very act of adultery. And you saw me when I extended mercy to the woman at Simon the Pharisee's house. I've cared for you, Judas. I taught you. I camped out with you. I've trained you. And I've loved you. And even now, I speak to you graciously. I speak with kindness instead of anger. Luke twenty two forty eight. 48, Jesus says, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Friend, why have you come? Comrade, companion, co-laborer, why have you come? That question places responsibility on Judas. Jesus is basically saying, is this what it has all come down to? Are you betraying me with a kiss? The symbol of friendship, of tenderness, of devotion. You called me rabbi. I call you friend. But you're betraying me. And you're doing it as an outward show of affection. John gives us more insight in John 18, verses 4 through 8. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, 
then let these men go. That to me has a bit of ironic humor to it because at first they're standing and you have to picture they've got a great group of people behind them. They're armed with swords and, and clubs. They have their lanterns and their torches. They're there as uh, arresting officers. They're belligerent and they're very, they're very intimidating. And that's why I see a bit of humor in it because Jesus said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And then John says, when he said, I am he, they fell to the ground. And so the next question has to be asked to them. It doesn't say they got up. It has to be asked them whether they're down on the ground. And he said, who are you looking for? To me, that's kind of a funny picture. Because these people are there to arrest him, and yet he's in control. They weren't in control of him. He was in control of them. Who are you looking for? I told you I'm he. Then let these go. As a good shepherd, he's caring for his sheep. Well, as this is all taking place, you can imagine what it would have been like. I mean, a moment before they had been praying and Jesus had been ministering to them. You have eight men who had stationed, were stationed at the, at the gateway to enter into that garden. It's now filled with people. It's loud. There's a lot of commotion going on. Judas has walked up. Peter, James, John are there. They see Judas as he walks up to Jesus, takes him by the shoulder, starts smothering his face with kisses. Then you see Jesus responding, have you come to betray me? What are you doing? And you see all of this taking place. And as it is, you have this, this man, Simon Peter, who's watching this take place. And remember, Simon had earlier said, that I, will, I will not only go to prison for you, Jesus, I will die for you. And now it's his opportunity as he sees this taking place and they're coming to take his master and it's so much commotion, the apostle Peter's there and he takes out his sword. The Bible tells us in John 18 verses 10 and 11, Simon Peter who had a sword drew it and struck the high priest's servant cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the father has given me? Luke tells us in chapter 22, 49 through 51, when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? One of them struck the servant of the high priest, cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, permit even this. He touched his ear and healed him. This is going down. It's real. Peter doesn't know what to do, so he pulls out his sword. And he takes a swing. And it just so happens Malchus is in front of him. Even to this day, in the Middle East, there are certain things that occur with the use of your left hand and other things that occur with the use of your right hand. Your right hand, you will, you will use your hand to eat. You will shake hands with your right hand. The left hand can be used for a variety of things, including... Uh, personal bathroom duties. And so that even back 2,000 years ago, uh, if you wanted to insult somebody, you would hand them your left hand because that is a great insult. So the, the, the boys, even if they were natural left-handers, would be trained with the use of the right hand. So we know that the apostle Peter would have drawn a sword with his right hand. We know that. He would have used his right hand. He'd have pulled the sword with his right hand to use it. Now, why am I bringing that up? Because I want you to notice that the gospel writers told us Malchus's right ear was cut off. His right ear, portion of his ear was cut off. His right ear. So if, if I'm the apostle Peter, there's a commotion going on and there's people around me and I'm going to protect the Lord and I pull my sword and I, and I swing my sword at somebody and I hit their head if they're facing me, which ear is going to get hit? Their left ear. How come Malchus's right ear got cut off? Because he hit him from behind. The punk. No, he, <laughs> he hit him from behind. He just swung. It's a good thing he was a fisherman and not a swordsman, by the way, because he only cut a, cut a portion of his ear off. What if he did cut his whole head off? That would have been interesting because Luke tells us that he touched his ear and healed him. What if he cut his head off? He could have taken his head, put it on backwards. Hey, this will help you in case somebody sneaks up. No, but that is kind of funny to think about. You know, later on, Melchus would have gone to see what had happened. 
He knew the burning sensation of losing a portion of his ear. He knew what that felt like, and blood would have poured out and caked on his neck. And later on, he would have seen as he was washing the wound how that he had actually been healed by the one that they had come to arrest, the mercy of God even to the very end. And the, and, uh, and the apostle Peter doesn't understand what's going on at all. That's why in verse 52, Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Now that would be said to stop the violence from escalating because it would have gotten very heavy had Jesus not done something quickly and it would have resulted in the death of the apostles. Somebody said, Matthew's words are obviously not a general rule declaring the unlawfulness of all warfare, but are limited in their range by the occasion. Resistance at that time would have involved certain destruction as the Roman soldiers would have slaughtered them. More than that, it would have been fighting not for God, but against him because they would be fighting against the fulfillment of his purpose. You see, acts of violence to achieve personal ends is never to be rewarded. And we need to remember that the battle is spiritual. And Jesus would be saying, had you watched and prayed, you would have understood that. He goes on and he makes this statement in verse 53. Do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions of angels represents 72,000 angels. Now, what is that saying? If I needed help, I have 72,000 angels at my disposal. Uh, Simon, I don't need your help. In 2 Kings, in chapter 19, in the Old Testament, uh, that chapter records how an Assyrian army came against a king, a king of Judah by the name of Hezekiah, about 700 years before Christ. And as this uh, Assyrian uh, military force came against uh, Hezekiah, Hezekiah began to pray, and, and he asked God, save us from this certain destruction. And so there was a prophet at that time by the name of Isaiah, and Isaiah sent word to Hezekiah that God had heard Hezekiah's prayer and, and sent the message, God says he will defend the city to save it for his own sake and for David's sake. And in 2 Kings 19.35, it says, It came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. And so Peter, Jesus is saying, I have access to forces that would immediately annihilate the entire Roman army. Do you really think I need your anger to accomplish my plans? Remember James 1.20, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Sometimes we think that because there are things that are wrong that we need to do something to defend God. We have to be aware of the fact that the Lord is able to very ably defend himself. As Christians, we realize that the society that we live in has transformed. It has changed remarkably in, in not that many years. In not that many years. The, uh, the society that we live in today would grieve, and it used to grieve my mother from a different era. My mom on occasion would say to me, son, I just don't get it. I don't understand where this world is going to, because she came from an entirely different background and a different United States. My mother and my dad, your grandparents perhaps, came from a different background, entirely different. There are things today that would cause them to blush that young people today think is normal. They think it's ordinary and it's real. It's just the way it is. And people don't even think about it anymore at all. So many things. But my parents and your grandparents, great-grandparents, they came from an entirely different background. 
And my mom would say things on occasion to me, like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go home, David, she'd tell me. I'm ready to go home. She said, this world is getting so different. It's so much worse than when I grew up. And, and I would say to her, Mama, you know, it's just time to strap on the sword and go to battle. I mean, we as Christians, this is what it's always been about. We're out there to reach people for Jesus Christ. Don't lose heart, Mama. God is on the throne. Things are going to be okay. And yet at the same time, my mom had a point. She would make a point because it was legitimate. There were things she would see that she would see now on TV that is like porn. I mean, when you have hamburger commercials that are porn, hamburger commercials that are porn, that wasn't the world my mom and dad grew up in. They didn't grow up in that. There was a thing called decency. There was something called modesty. I see, our, I see Christians argue about modesty today. I see people arguing, saying, it's your fault if you stumble and, and are tempted by the way that person is dressed. It's your fault because we're so self-centered. We have substituted so many things for, for a life. We, ha we, we think that we're actually having a personal conversation when we have text messages. We think, I use my, all the time. I use my phone like anybody else does, but I don't substitute that for real relationships. And yet there are people who think they're having real relationships because they text one another. When in fact, it's simply saying to someone, I don't have time to talk to you. I will get back to you when I feel like it. That's what we're doing. That's why people will go to church today with a man on a screen like the Wizard of Oz. You don't need a pastor there, a body there talking to you. I'll just look at them like I do on, on, on the screen at home. I don't even have to be there. There are people who aren't on church on, in church on Sunday because they're watching a worship service in terms of music at one church, and so they move to the teaching on another, and they never go out. They never serve. They don't contribute. They do nothing. They just take. That's what it's like today. See, we don't understand. And so what happens is people like me can get frustrated, and people like you sometimes, and we can say, what happened to this nation that we lived in? What happened to this nation that used to fear God? What happened to a nation that used to pray, a nation that used to care? And we, will, we actually will mythologize the United States into what it was like it was a great city on a hill, when in fact, we've always needed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've always had sinners. We've never had a righteous president. We have had Christians who were in office, but we've always needed to preach the gospel. We've always needed transformation. And what happens is we get kind of concerned about that, and before you know it, we get angry. And then you get mad Christians marching over this and angry about that. And the world looks at us and says, where's this message of love? And you say, oh, it's a message of righteousness. Indeed it is. But where's your love? See, Pastor Chuck Smith, my pastor, hated hippies. He hated me and people like me. Why? Because we were slobs and dopers and drunks. It was Kay who loved the hippies, his wife. And they would, they would be there at Huntington Beach, and she would she'd be looking at ki kids and perhaps me and people like me walking by, you know, barefooted, loaded, drunk, or whatever at the beach. And, and she would she'd be there with Chuck, and Chuck would be there with his arms folded, and he'd be saying, those dirty slobs ought to get a job. And then he'd look at his wife, and she'd be crying, praying, Jesus, save those kids. We need that today, too, by the way, don't we? We need that today. We're angry. We're so angry. We're living in angry times. The wrath of man, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It doesn't. The apostle Peter's there with this little sword, and he's saying, I'm going to defend God. <laughs> and Jesus says, put your sword away. Put your sword away. I don't need your help. I really don't, Peter. Appreciate your zeal. You see, Peter earlier had said to Jesus, I'll die for you. I can't help but admire this man. I mean, all of these people inside of that garden. And there's the apostle, and he says, let's go down. I like him. I like men like him. I do. Fighters, warriors. I'll take you out. Turn around. Let me hit you in the head, Malchus. <laughs> he wasn't a punk. Later on, John speaks concerning the fact that the apostle Peter, by himself, pulls up a net with 153 fish in it. Any fisherman in this room knows 
how powerful you'd have to be to be able to pull up that large a catch by yourself. He was powerful. He was, he was a man's man. He was a man's man. But he was wrong. And Jesus said, put your sword away. How is God's word going to be fulfilled if you try to act out in the flesh? That's what Jesus is saying, verse 54. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen in this way? The Bible said, Isaiah 53, verse 1, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The Bible says I'm going to be rejected. The Bible says a friend will betray me. Psalm 41, 9, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. The Bible says that I'm going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11, 12, they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. The scriptures prophesy it's got to happen. You're trying to thwart it once again. You're opposing the work of the Lord, Peter, the work of the Lord in salvation. Remember, Jesus had prepared them, but once again, Peter had resisted. Back in Matthew 16, it says in verses 21 and 22, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, be raised the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. He's done it before. You're thwarting the will of God with your fleshly efforts. Scripture has to be fulfilled. This is done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, he said in verse 56. And then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Again, he had said that earlier. In verse 31, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. As much as you'd like to believe you'll remain faithful when it comes down to it, when the rubber meets the road, you're going to get up and you're going to go. You're going to leave me. I will die for you. No, you won't. No, you won't. You will forsake me. They left. Perhaps they were afraid of suffering. Perhaps they were afraid of even dying. Whatever it is, the scripture says it, all the disciples, all the disciples forsook him and fled. They forsook him. But he never forsook them. One of my scriptures that I love and I'll close with is in the book of Hebrews, which simply says, one of the verses simply says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you read that in the original language, it is, I will never, never, never. It's a triple emphasis. I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus once said, and now I'm alone, and yet I'm not alone, for you are with me. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You are with me. God doesn't leave you. You can start walking away from him, and some do. You go through pain, and you go through sorrow. You go through moments where your own heart is ripped out of your body and shown to you almost in a visual way where your heart, where you say, God, show me my heart. And the Lord does. He, it's like he sometimes he, he opens your chest and pulls out your heart and says, you want to see it? It's desperately wicked. And, 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 and you see it and you say, oh, my God. Oh, my God. That is me. That's the way I am. Listen, you get saved and you walk with the Lord and God begins to do new things in your life, but after a while you begin to realize that so much of the old person is still there and so much of that old nature desires to be dominant and, and you find out you actually in a spiritual life have a spiritual war and it's a warfare that seems to be constant and it doesn't stop. And there are times when you feel like the Apostle Peter, you walk on water and then like the Apostle Peter, you sink. 
There are times when you can have a, a very high relationship with the Lord where everything is firing on every cylinder and God is moving. And then there are other times when you say, I'm a wretch. God, how could you? And the enemy begins to whisper in your ear and sometimes friends will, will, will harm you and then sometimes your heart will betray you. And the people you love the most sometimes hurt you the most. Your family and your friends. But he never forsakes you. I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. Thank you, Jesus, for you remain faithful when I'm unfaithful. You're good when I'm not. You're there when I'm absent. You empower me when I'm strong and you heal me when I'm broken. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness to me. You are a savior worth worshiping and I love you. Christianity. Christianity. You're never alone. You're never alone. You're never alone. He loves you. And though they forsook him and fled, he never forsook them. And he bled. That's how it works in Christianity. He took it upon himself so that you could be set free by him. He knew what his men would do. He told them what they would do. But he had also said to the apostle Peter, I have prayed for you that your strength fails not. And after that, you have been converted Strengthen your brethren. You're going to learn. You're going to learn. And you will be strong because I will make you strong. That's how it works. God breaks a man that he might shape that man. And once he's broken you and made you, then you can stand strong in him because you will know without you, I can do nothing. But with you, I can do all things.